I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Gadigal people. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And they're wines that um, I hope strike a chord in people, you know, bring out emotive uh, feelings. That's the reason I love wine, you know, so I think that's why and what I look for when I bring wines over here is to, to, to give, give people a, 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 some sort of a pleasurable pleasurable sensation. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Andrew Gard is one of Australia's leading wine personalities. Sommelier at heart, Andrew's wine focus evolved into specialised wine imports in 2007. Today, his portfolio represents some of the most sought-after labels from artisan producers. His dedication to representing the humans behind the bottle is inspirational, and wine culture in Australia is markedly more diverse because of his influence. Hi, Gardy. Thanks for joining me. Hey, Shante. How are you? Thanks for having me on the uh, on the podcast. Oh, it's totally our honour. Thank you for making the time. Um, let's have a little. Let's go back. Let's discuss um, a little bit about how you got into wine imports and where your love of wine began. Okay. Well, my uh, my love of wine came definitely after school because my my parents didn't really drink wine um, in in the home. My dad was a was a beer drinker. And so um, through high school, I, um, you know, at, when I was 18, we used to drink beer and stuff at school as well. So it was really when I left school and went to hotel school, which is what I did as my tertiary education, that I was exposed to wine through working in restaurants. And um, I worked with a particular group of people. Um, some of them I'm still friends with, like Willie Pettigrew and Michael Solomons. Um, and we had a, like a really nice group that used to go away on the weekends and, and get bottles of wine and go to restaurants and talk about them. And that sort of enabled us or me to get some sort of, a, I guess, a, a, a dialogue going um, with, with uh, how to describe wine and, and how, to, how to sort of uh, explain wine to people. And, and, and so I became more comfortable with it. And I started buying wine for my own cellar. And my dad got interested in wine. I finally got him off the beers. And and into wine and and so it really all started from there i probably was about 18 or 19 wow way ahead of the game and it often it works the other way around your parents have a cellar and you yeah. drink beer and i love that there's the inverse of that um you walked into a small wine store in paris in 1998 and i think that moment was quite um a big moment for you can you tell us about that day and uh how it changed you yeah well um I was working for uh, for a guy called Tony Bilson at that point, and um, I remember going over to his his apartment in Sydney before I went on that trip. And he said, um, "Listen, this guy is a really good friend of mine over there. He lets me stay in his apartment. Would you mind giving him a couple of great Australian bottles of wine from me?" <clears throat> and I said, "Sure." <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, would, you, would you want me to give them to him? And he said, "Yeah, take them over to his apartment, and um, and you'll meet him. He's a great guy. He's a painter." So I went over there that morning. I had these bottles. I actually literally traveled around France with these two annoying bottles in my suitcase the whole time. I couldn't wait to get rid of them. And um, so I jumped on the on the metro and I went over to his, his little apartment in the 7th arrondissement and I said, g'day. I put the bottles on the table and um, and this dog jumped up and, and knocked all this coffee all over me <laughs> and um, all over my shirt and pants. And, and I had to go to – I had a, a restaurant reservation – you know, after the meeting, I had to go back to the to the hotel and get, get changed again. And um, in any case, uh, I made it to the restaurant and then and and I had a great meal. And after the restaurant, um, I was I was on the way walking back past this uh, this little shop, and I looked to the left and I was like, that place looks just like it's out of Charles Dickens. You know, it looked amazing. It was uh, had all these old bottles of eau de vie and cognac in the window and these these beautiful old looking bottles of wine and I thought you know Nate you know curiosity got me and I walked in and I'd read this book called uh, um, The Wild Bunch by Patrick Matthews and it it the narrative was basically how family wineries uh, in France uh, artisanal wineries who were very interested in terroir and non-interventionist winemaking it was the narrative was about the path to, to the market in the UK that they had, and he wrote this beautiful book. and And some of the wineries that were in um, in the book, featured in the book, were actually in that in that shop. So everything sort of came together. And the, the the guy who owned the shop spoke English. He actually was 
he'd already been to, he'd been to Tetsuya's in Sydney, so this guy was pretty well travelled. And so we just whiled away the rest of the afternoon drinking these bottles and tasting wine, and it really opened my eyes a lot. And and at that at that point, there was a seed planted in my head that I would love to be able to bring those kind of wines back to Australia, uh, and 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 share them in the market over here one day. And so about ten years later, I I, I did. Wow, it's pretty uncanny. First of all, that you were just happened to wander into that store, but then also that he spoke English. Yeah. Um, then that you recognised some of the labels, and that he was someone willing to open and and talk to you about things. It must have just really been you were just meant to be there at that time. Yeah, it really was quite um, serendipitous in that in that sense. Um, and and you know the, the the book is a book that's out of print now and. Um, I mean, if you would ever like to borrow it, I have a copy. It's quite a cool book. But it was that book kind of made me really think about different kinds of wines because in the, you know, in the mid-90s in, in, in Australia, early to mid-90s, the, the, there was imported wine. There were probably three or four big importers of wine. and But there wasn't a lot of choice. The major appellations were covered um, around the world. But there was probably only two or three outside of Burgundy, two or three um, different producers from from each appellation available, and even Australian wine. The domestic market was, um, you know, was very very different. The, the cutting edge producers back then, um, and they are still cutting edge. There's uh, there's no change there. But things like Bass Phillip and Giaconda and and Wendery and Jasper Hill and and, and things like that. Um, you know, th- those were the wines that were, you know, Veritas and the Barossa, Rockford. Those were the sort of things that people were clamouring for, um, you know, back back then. Um, and imported wine was it was kind of, it was a thing, but it was really only about 20% of the wine list and 80% was domestic. And, you know, now I think it's probably, I don't know, 50-50 maybe between domestic and, and I look at all the domestic wines that are, available now and I'm blown away I'm, it makes me super happy to see so much experimentation all the different young people that have have, have kind of traveled and and trying new experimental techniques and growing different grapes that weren't even around then so you know everything's really evolved in the last 20 years oh 100 percent, it has and I mean you were a really big part of that Andrew I know you're very humble but um talk to me I mean we, we, I, mean, I want to get onto, you know, what the kind of wine consumption of the Australian market, how it's changed. But talk to me a little bit about how you go, oh, I'd love to import these wines one day, and then you actually do that. Because a question oh. I get often um, from a lot of guests is, oh, how do you find these wines to put on your list? And my first port of call is to talk to them a little bit about distribution and um, portfolios. So how do you go from tasting a couple of wines over in France to then saying, I'm going to build a business where this goes. I mean, I, I imagine there's quite a lot of logistics involved. Yeah, definitely. So um, to touch on the nuts and bolts side of it, um, the business of importing wine is is such that um, there are different companies around the world who specialize in, in logistics. And there's a couple who specialize in, in liquor or liquid logistics. Um, and so some of those companies in the last 10 years have started to offer part container loads or pallet loads um, as, 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 uh, as this way for smaller people to get into the, to the business more easily. So rather than having to fill a whole 20 foot container um, full of wine, which is, you know, which is about 9,000 bottles uh, and that's quite expensive to buy all that wine. And if you're getting started, you know, the wineries will have you pay up front and then You've got to pay everything up front to start with. So this is an easy way for people to get started, and it's called an LFL, less than full load. Um, well, what? There's quite a few people that, that, that offer that service now. So, you know, I um, I sort of started out bringing pallets of wine in. Uh, so what happens is, you, you know, you taste the wine over there and you, you talk to the winemaker, you reserve some wine, and you try and work out, when you're going to ship it and you engage a shipping company, you, you get the invoice sent over, you get back labels, which are obligatory put on with all the, all the, all the standard mentions and the legal mentions. And then you pay the invoice and you, you ask the shipping company to contact the grower to collect the wine and then they'll schedule it into one of their shipments coming to Australia. 
and um, it takes about five weeks for the for the marine transport. And then you'll get what's called a disbursement invoice, which is all the taxes and duties. And you pay that just as the wine, as just as the boats coming into port. And then you pay the freight invoice, which is all of the local costs and the freight component. Um, and that that then the wine will be delivered to your um, you know to your uh, to your warehouse. And from that point on, you you know you you mark the wine up. You put your profit on it, and and um, you still have a. If you're a wholesaler like me, obviously the wine isn't really cleared until you you pay the wet that's owed on it and the GST that's owed on the on the wholesale sale. So, um, really, only then is the is the is the transaction finished, and that can take as long as it takes to sell the wine. So that's the nuts and bolts side of things. Yeah, it's actually really nice to hear. Um that kind of explained because I mean I'm familiar with most of it but it's actually nice that, that was so succinct so thank you for that <laughs> well um, I mean the thing is these days as well Shante uh, there's like Google Translate which probably wasn't around it certainly has evolved a lot now so you know there's also so many different things that can be done online to facilitate business these days and even the communication side of things is a lot is a lot easier for people. So I think it's I don't think it's super hard to get started doing doing uh, wine importing uh, these days. Yeah, I'm bet very very different from the first time you started. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of outgoing costs <clears throat> even just to set up. Do you remember the first wine that you ever purchased for import and um, the first wine you said yes, I want that and I'll agree. I mean, how, do you remember that first wine? Yeah, I remember the trip because the trip was in 2007 and. Um, and our daughter Zoe was tiny. I think she was three months old or something like that. And so it's what I remember is just driving around France with this little human in the back <laughs> of the car, you know. And, um, yeah, we, we we actually did do a container for our first shipment because we, we had been saving for such a long time. And we worked with uh, – we went to see people like Thierry Pouzelat at Clos de Tuberf. We went to see Hervé Suho in the Rhone. Uh, John Foyard in Morgan, um, Eric Fiffeling from Lungalore, and all these producers, you know, very, very happily we still work with today. Um, there's a couple that we went to see. I remember I went to see a guy in Puy Fuise, um, and we bought some wine off him for a couple of years, but we, 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 we don't work with him anymore. But I would say 80% of the first shipment, we, we, we still work with all those people. And... Um, it's kind of a little bit nerve wracking because you don't know how you're going to sell the wine when you first buy it, but um, you know that you like it, and and if you know that you like it, that's the best chance you have of selling anything. Um, and that's that's kind of that was always my modus operandi. If I if I like it enough, then and and I know that it, the market in in Sydney will accept it, and then further than that, the market in Australia, then I've got the best chance. Yeah, that makes sense, and you. Your portfolio is quite concise and um, I feel like it makes it makes sense holistically. Each producer that you have, I know, has gone through like a rigorous selection process to be there. So other than the fact that you like it, how else are you choosing wines to add to your portfolio and where does it you know, end when you start to say, I, I want a lot more or I don't want to add too many more Um What's the consideration uh, process there? Well, the, the, my portfolio, um, as you probably have seen, it doesn't have any real structure to it other than the fact that they're all wines that I really like and regions that I really like. So, for example, in France, um, I don't really drink many wines from the southwestern part of France, and so they're not in the portfolio. Um, and I like wines a lot from the Rhone Valley and the Loire Valley, so there's quite a lot of those in the portfolio. Um, I don't drink much champagne. I like champagne a lot, but I don't drink much. And I, my interest isn't massive in champagne, so I have one producer. Um, and it really goes like that um, around the whole portfolio. So I really like in Spain, I love Rioja and I love the Sierra de Grados. So I've got Rioja and Sierra de Grados in the portfolio. Um, but I don't have Albarino Um it's not that I don't like it, but I don't love it. And I just wouldn't be able to sell it as well because, and thankfully there's other people out there who are passionate about different regions and they, they, you know, they specialize in those areas, but that's, that's sort of how it goes with me. And I think 
people know that and that's actually been been good for me because they know that that the areas that I specialize in or have in my list I'm very very interested in and passionate about so so the selection criteria is very strong yeah it's it's certainly very confident is the way I kind of see it in that you trust your own palate and you trust that you're the one selling the wine at the end of the day perhaps if you had other employees that particularly love say um, very spacious and maybe it would make sense to add a wine there but at the end of the day you're the one selling the wine and and um, you're the one that's passionate about it so I it makes a lot of sense to me. And I think, like you said, I think it has been a really strong point for yourself. Um, yeah. But you actually started as a sommelier. Can you, yeah. do you have any memories of your time working as a sommelier that you think of fondly or perhaps not so fondly? And what, <laughs> and what, what, what was that kind of time of your life like? Look, I loved working in restaurants and um, the emotions of working in restaurants are, are incredible. And one of the things that I, miss most about working in restaurants is um you know the frenetic nature uh, of keeping people happy you know everything needs to work in very very fine timing um you need to navigate not only the moods of the staff around you but you know the the chefs and the and and you know the the whole glamour of the dining room and and everyone's suited up and it's it's such a great experience. It's a real rush, and you know I always remember when you nail a service. If you if everything works well and everyone's happy, and you know the the owners do well, it's a really really satisfying feeling uh, at the end of the night. You know everyone's learnt a little bit about something, um, and and everyone's tired in that just in that good way of being tired, where you've you're sort of you're happy tired because you you know you've pushed yourself, and 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 like I said, everyone's worked as a team. That feeling's amazing, um, and obviously I miss that. Um, and also, I think that um, restaurants are good because you your work that day you can see the success and failure of it immediately. And in my work now, it can take a very long time from the start of when you start working on something to see, you know, to see that sort of the satisfaction in people and and people's happiness. You you, you don't there's not the immediacy. In, in the wholesale wine trade as there is working in restaurants and and you know that's yeah that's what I miss and and the, just the camaraderie the, there's nothing like it working in restaurants some of the, some of my best friends today are people that I met through that time in my life and and uh, and worked with so it's uh, yeah very emotional for me I love restaurants I lo- now I love eating in them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the high ground. <laughs> <Even the rest. laughs> you. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about kind of the culture of Australian wine consumption and how yeah. it's changed over time. What are the, the marked points that you think have changed Australian wine culture and the drinking culture over time? Has there been um, particular influences that you think have really changed the market and, and what we want to drink? Times. I, I think that, um, y- you know, Australia being where it is on the map in the world um, means that we are, you know, we love travel. We're huge travellers and very, very inquisitive people when it comes to travelling around the world and, um, and very open-minded as a people, the Australians. And I think that we bring things back and reinterpret them in, in our way back back here. So... You see that a lot, particularly with chefs. But since the sommelier um, uh, role has become such a big thing in the last 20 years and maybe longer, I think the travel aspect and also um, the aspect of, of the, the rigorous training in Australia, whether it's through the show system, now through the WESET, now through the Master Sommelier Organisation, um, and also work of guys like myself, guys like David Burkett and, and, and many other colleagues in the industry that I respect. Um, the confluence of all of those things has, has um, and I left one out, all the winemakers, the, the younger winemakers that have been producing all these different wines. If you add all of that, that together, that's created the landscape um, that exists today and the multitude of, of choice um, that, that we all have happily now, um, which makes up our beautiful landscape. And to be honest with you, I travel a bit, well, when I can, 
and I think the the food and wine scene in Australia is really second to none. It's uh, it's a really great place to go out. Yeah, we kind of do just have everything within arm's reach, don't we? Mm. And we're kind of a little bit spoiled for choice almost in 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 what we want to eat and drink. I imagine your cellar looks pretty nifty. <laughs> when you are when you're choosing not to drink your wines at home, do you have a, a particular place you love to do a little BYO or I like um, I, I can't mention any names about anything. I'll, I'll be honest with you because I'm I'm nearly forty eight years old. My brain isn't what it used to be, and I literally, I'll, I'll forget. I'll forget all my friends. Everyone I was supposed to remember, shout out to, and I'll, I'll forget, and and so I'll get in trouble. But yeah, I um I I love going to to restaurants to BYO, and you know, usually in especially in Sydney, those restaurants are kind of um, you know they're smaller family run places. Quite often, you know, they're, they're ethnic restaurants, um, and they're a lot of fun. You can be loud and noisy. Sometimes you've got to take your own glasses in there, um, you know, that sort of thing. And and they're places that you can let your hair down and have a lot of fun. But um, you know, I also like going to restaurants and buying wine off the wine list. I like to see what the contemporary look and feel around me is. And um, it also um, gives me a chance to drink wines that I don't work with and see what other people are, are doing and and see what sommeliers are choosing and liking. So it's important not just to have your focus only on what you do so yeah when I go out to restaurants unless it's like a you know like it's a throw down with your buddies or whatever then um almost I'm nearly always order off the wine list yeah that's nice to hear um yeah I imagine that I mean after 15 years now of importing your own wine are you able to be selective about who you want to to sell your wine to is are you or are you just happy to kind of offload it and you want it to get out there to everyone and everyone or or do you want to be a little bit more selective about where your wines are shown so we look having been a restaurant uh, person and 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 a sommelier i have always gravitated towards selling our wines into restaurants and obviously you know good restaurants because a lot of the wines that that i like and work with are terroir wines or terroir specific wines you know, expensive wines because of the labour of love involved in making them, um, and so they 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 really do have a natural home in in fine restaurants. Um, over the years, some of the regions that we have have sort of, I guess, almost pioneered, like like the Jura for one, have become super popular, and so we've wound up in some regions having to allocate the wines over the last few years, which is a little bit. Um, it's a bit frustrating on the side of the customer and it's a little difficult for us too, but it really is the only way of fairly um, appropriating a handful of bottles um, into the market. And that's, that's on one hand, but then on the other hand, you know, we bring in quite a significant amount of things like Chablis and Cote de Rhone and Alsace Riesling and, and wines that are, I guess you could say, everyday drinking wines, um, fine wines, but not, not, not wines that um, we have any uh, need to allocate. So we balance the, those two things uh, as part of our job, really. Yeah. And it is about kind of wine for all occasions, I suppose. But um, talk to me a little bit about the the wonderful people that you represent. And I know international travel has been quite difficult lately, but how do you translate those experiences of perhaps being welcomed into someone's home and, and really finding out about the individuals behind the wine. And how do you go about trying to communicate that when you sell wine? Um, yeah, the moments that you spend with people in their own home and their cellar is is really, you know, it is unique. And, and quite often, you know, we share a meal and stuff at the end and you get to meet, um, you know, the grandma, the kids and the uncles and stuff over the years. They These are people that you end up, you know, you don't see them often, but but when you do, it's 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 a very very nice uh, time and nice feeling, and, and it's educational because every year, you know, you'll learn something different about what they do, and and maybe they might have a new vineyard that they've been planting, or they can explain the weather, or the grandfather might have an anecdotal story, um, and so it really does, really sort of, I guess, lay strong foundations um, in in between us, but. Um, 
you know, it, it isn't it isn't something that's ever easy to do travel because it's very, very taxing. You know, some of the days we will get up at six in the morning, do an hour's worth of emailing work, and then throw down some sort of sandwich for breakfast, jump in the car, you've got your first meeting at nine, and then uh, you've got another meeting at 11. This is drinking and, and spitting out alcohol the whole time, and then driving, and then you've got lunch somewhere, and you'll be eating something rich and heavy, and drinking wine. At lunch, you've got to drink, so you're going to drink, then then you've got to go to a meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon, then you've got another one at four o'clock in the afternoon, and I guarantee you the one at four because the sun's going to go down at about 5.30. He's going to invite you out to dinner at his house or in a restaurant. By the time you get back, you're tired, you're a little bit drunk, and, um, and you've, got to, you know, you've got to do the same thing the next day. This could go on for weeks. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it can be taxing, let me tell you. <laughs> I feel like 80% of the population listening to this are going to be like, are you kidding me? What a wonder. But I completely understand. I know, I know, you. but it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of fun. And you know what, Shante, after two years of COVID and no travel, I'll be ripping in. I'll be, I'll be ripping in. Don't worry. <laughs> but I completely agree with you. At the end of the day, you know, you have a job to do and you, you need to be proactive and you need to be present in the moment. And yeah, you have one big, great day out like that. And it's the best thing ever, but to follow it up day after day and yeah. you must come home and just think now I need a, a holiday from the, the travel and you just don't get to do that. So, well, um, happily we, you know, in Italy, we've, we work a, a bit in Italy. We've got, you know, seven producers in Italy, which out of you know, the whole of Italy is not many. So when my wife and I, when we travel to Italy together, um, it's paradise because you have one meeting a day. You know, we've got seven producers between Piemonte and Sicily. <laughs> wow. so oh, my God. That, I mean, that's you like you can't believe line. how that is. But, you know, we, we might have seven producers in, 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 in one region in some other places. And that's, that, 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 can be, that can be a lot of work. Like, yeah. Know, a lot of work. So um, it, it, just, it just depends. It just depends. Yeah, of course. Um, I want to touch a little bit on um, – being that you you represent such small kind of vignerons and and really small you know uh, artisanal uh, producers, what are some of the challenges with that? And what are some of the things that you wish perhaps sommeliers would understand more about working with these small producers? Or um, you know what are the challenges there? Well, the hardest thing in in my job, and I think it would dovetail with what you do too, is is to keep people happy. Keeping people happy is, is, is difficult and managing expectations is difficult um, and managing expectations comes down to good communication and, you know, maybe I'm not always good at, at communication because, you know, I, it, it can get busy and, and um, I'm, maybe I'm not a great communicator anyway and that, that, that's what I find hard because, you know, really I am in the service industry uh, and I'm, I, you know, I'm in sales and service, um, and then, you know, not really marketing. Just it's sales, really, sales and service driven. So, I'm. I think my product's great, but my my maybe my my service um, and and my communication could be better. But I'm a I'm a one man band, and it's by choice. So, those are the struggles that I face. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that I kind of am conscious of is that when, you know, people want um, particular wines and cult wines from, you know, your portfolio, which a lot of them really are, I imagine that a lot of people kind of chime in and want to get their hands on, you know, um, a new release of something and, you know, constantly asking for back vintages of something else. And um, I imagine that sometimes, you know, you, you have to be a bit selective and kind of and look at the people that support you Um and your portfolio, you know, year after year and, and month after month and, um, you know, and rather than just kind of piping up when they just want uh, the new release of Foyard or whatever it may be. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we have to manage, we've got to manage um, the the relationship here, but connected to the relationship here is the relationship with the winemaker. And so we also need to think, I say we, but it's generally me, but got to think about um, with the winemaker, where would they want their wines? You know, they, they would love to have their wines in the best places, you know, and we've got to just manage that with, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult if people 
are not week to week or month to month customers and then once a year we'll say hey you know can we get the tightest allocated wine that you've got mm. it's very hard for us to to then turn around to people who um who we've had good work and communication with all throughout the year um and justify why they can't get that wine and so it's also difficult um you know in some instances all businesses go through cash flow crises and problems mine too and, and you, you know we have to manage that so sometimes you know people people are struggling to pay um sometimes you might have a great relationship with a client and they move on to another place and a new person that comes in has a better relationship with another supplier and you know what i mean shante things are mm. always in flux things things are always moving and so i would say um to people who are frustrated about sometimes how we operate that that it isn't nothing's ever set in stone things are always um things are always moving and um we we are very f- flexible um but you know with the caveat that it's hard to allocate the greatest ones we have to to places where we have no consistency um if that makes if you know if that's clear yeah i think that yeah absolutely that is um Talking about your Australian offerings, that's just yeah. always something I've wanted to ask you, putting you mm. under the spotlight here. But you, I, right. think, <laughs> I think we've got four, <laughs> four or five producers from Australia. Yeah. yeah. How? I mean, how does that come about, and how do you choose those couple of producers that you represent it's, in Australia? Uh, there is no rhyme or reason to my Australian portfolio. It's, it's, <laughs> it's pure friendships and and so forth. So. Um, the closest one in in um, in geographic uh, location to me is is Richie Harkham in the Hunter, and Richie's become a great friend over the years. Introduced by Tony Bilson, God bless his soul, when he was still around, he introduced us in around two thousand and ten, and Richie was making kosher, uh, natural styled wines from the Hunter Valley, you know, with with um, with all sorts of different kind of um, you know different grower relationships, and he had this very really interesting story in the wines. He had a winemaker helping him in the beginning, and I always wanted to work with the Hunter Valley, the Tyrrells family. I'm still friends with them. I used to be friends with Murray. Now I'm friends with Chris. I love the Tyrrells. I love all their wines. I love the Hunter, um, and so. It makes sense. I really wanted to have a Hunter Valley winery. I'm a Sydney boy, so, you know, I, Richie's wines were, were perfect there. Then John the Gorker in Henty. Um, I love the wines from Henty. It's, um, it's a proper cold climate area, so he has these stunning crystal Rieslings and beautiful earthy Pinots. We've been working together since 2006, um, and so that's a very old relationship. Luke from Taitari in the Mornington. He's a super talented guy mm. working on a, with a couple of sites. And he's someone who grows bottles and everything on the estate. So it's a very, he controls quality completely. And he's got a very, very deft hand. His wines have lovely, lovely subtlety, beautiful inflections in the wines. And um, they're wonderfully balanced and wonderfully priced and nicely packaged. He really doesn't make it um, hard for anyone. So... Um, there's that, and then I've got I've got my two guys in uh, in um, in uh, well Dan Standish in the Barossa, who's my old colleague from Torbreck when I used to do the sales and marketing at Torbreck a long time ago, and he is literally one of the most talented guys um, that I work with anywhere in the world. He's he's a winemaker par excellence, and I'm very happy to see him getting all of the international kudos and um and domestic kudos now i mean we have to allocate his wines every year um and you know he's able to put his price up as he needs to and the market follows him so he's he's really a star in his own right so we're we're very lucky probably to have his wines he he certainly doesn't need a distributor anymore (laughs) no they're pretty phenomenal i agree (laughs) yeah he's so that that's him and that's really how it works with 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 us um with with the domestic with the domestic market they're very much passion projects um, and very much friendships, really. Well, that's good. Relationships is so much about what um, business is built off or successful businesses. Uh, yeah. When, if you looked at your portfolio and you were to give you give me a couple of words that represent the wines that you that you sell, um, 
I know that you've said to our based, but how else would you describe the wines that are in your portfolio? I, I know other people have referred to them as probably minimal intervention or Luke Resiné, but what, how would you like to think of your portfolio? I like to think of them as honest wines. Um, they're direct, very expressive wines because, you know, expression is a very important thing. You, you know, they're wines that are emotive, I think, um, and they're wines that have – they 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 give a very pleasurable sensation. So they they're wines that that um, I drink at home. So I can honestly say that every single wine I import, we 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 drink at home. We I don't know a lot of people that can honestly say that, um, but we drink all the bottles from the best to the most inexpensive. We will have them at home. So I believe in them that much. Um, they're wines that uh, are made. I won't, I won't say as simply as possible, but you know, without without as, with with minimal intervention. But not all of them are, are um, made with uh, no sulphur, or very very few are, have no sulphur. In fact, maybe only one or two producers make wines with no sulphur. So it's, there's always a a small amount of sulphur, sometimes a tiny amount, sometimes a, a, a you know a judicious amount. It just depends on the winemaker in the region. But um, they're always wines where there's some interesting terroir, there's uh, there's savoir faire. Quite often, there's generational experience, and they're wines that um, I hope strike a chord in people. You know, bring out emotive uh, feelings, and um, that's the reason I love wine. You know, so I think that's why and what I look for when I bring wines over here is to, you know, to 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 to, to give give people a. A, 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 some sort of a pleasurable, pleasurable sensation. I, I think they do very much just that. So you've achieved that, that's for sure. What's next for you in uh, 2022 and beyond? Well, um, so looking straight ahead in March, um, I'm going to try and start travelling to to Brisbane again and to Melbourne and try to do some tastings. And then from there in April, we're pretty busy. We've got a couple of containers landing in April, um, some stuff backed up from last year. And in May, I'm actually going to start planning a trip. So that takes us to the end of this financial year. But I'm going to yeah probably go to, to Europe in May. And at this point in time, it looks like I'm going to fly into into Malpensa, which is the Milan airport, and go to Piemonte in Liguria. That knocks off two producers for me in Italy um, and two that we work beautifully with. And then I'm going to drive up into either the Jura um, or I'm going to drive through the coast and through to Provence and then go up into France through the Rhone Valley and then, yeah, work it out from there. Oh, well, that sounds exciting. I'm so glad that you're able to travel again. And I'm certainly looking forward to what you bring back and the story <laughs> that you have to tell. I'll um, keep you posted I, for sure. Yes, please. Um, Andrew, I always ask, what were the, what if you had three beverages for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? I know it's a tough question, but uh, you still have to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. All right. So the first one is water. Water is my favorite drink. Um, and secondly... Uh, I got to think of a white wine, Riesling, and thirdly, Chardonnay de Pape. Mm. I'm on a Chardonnay de Pape kick at the moment, and especially at, with age as well. Yeah, well, with age or, or young, I just you know it's a it's a very interesting. You know, you've got thirteen grapes, four white, nine red, multitude of different terroir. You've got colder areas, sandy areas, shaly areas, stony areas, old bush vines. I mean, sometimes with the climate, the way it's going, they can be a little sunny and, and, and warm, but not always. And they're super complex. And for me, they just hit the spot somewhere in my, my body. I don't know what it is, but they just, they make me, they make my shoulders drop, you know. So I love shutting up to part Riesling. I just think is the is the business for and I, Shannon Block was almost getting in there, but Ooh. I got to say Riesling is probably where I I just love it. It's you know you can have heavyweight Rieslings from Alsace and from the from the Rheingau, and you can have these beautiful like super fine Rieslings from the Saar, 
and um, and the Mosul, and you you just you know I, I just I can't get enough of the stuff, and it it's uh, it's purity in a in a glass really, um, and in shadow enough to pups complexity in a glass, and water, well you're screwed if you haven't got that. So <laughs> so there's the three. I, I I'm surprised by those, but actually not when you talk about it. I mean. I agree, water. I, there's often within, you know, a day where I will marvel. I'm like, how good is water when I'm thirsty? So I completely oh, yeah. understand that. Yeah. But um, I, I agree with Shadow Nerf in that there's just so many possibilities, so many endless possibilities for, you know, white blends and and uh, the different kind of um, soil types. And um, I've always been a bit of a fan of Shadow Nerf. And, it's, it and- is a, it's a big wine, but, I mean, Grenache is something I really like. And, I mean, it, you, I could have gone for Burgundy and Barolo, um, and I'm sure some of your other guests will, and they are, they're 100% right too. But, you know, if I look back on the last, you know, 25 years or so um, and what I really like, and to answer that question correctly, it would probably be sh- it's going to be shut enough to pop. That's great. I love it. Well, I have loved chatting with you, and always thank you for the work that you do and what you offer the Australian market. We're all better because of it. Um, I hope that maybe sometime soon we get to see you in person. I've actually learned a little bit more about you today, um, especially the fact that you how courageous and brave you both you and your partner were to be having a three month old child traveling around going, you know what, let's buy a container of wine and sell it. It was was stressful, but it was fun. It's incredible. It really (laughs) just goes to show um, the, the jumping off a cliff into something brand new. So good on you. And it's worked out um, for you. And I'm thrilled for that. And thank you for spending some time with me today. It's been such a pleasure chatting to you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on the podcast, Shante. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. We'll chat soon. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at Over a Glass Pod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.